Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for what I promise you will be a meaningful and thought-provoking discussion on our collective responsibility of discussing race with our student athletes and coaches. This is part one of a two-part series. I am Anthony Thomas, NOMAD co-founder and board member and the director of athletics at Francis Parker School here in San Diego, California. Many of us are back playing games and being that positive influence in our kids' lives. However, no amount of games being played can erase what has happened and is still happening in our country. The social injustices, racism, and hatred has permeated throughout our communities and whether we know it or not has impacted our kids. They are watching. So what is our collective responsibility? As leaders in our community, we must do everything to teach our kids about advocating for themselves and leading difficult conversations. We know it is hard for us as adults, but our kids are talking about race too, and we need to be there for them. Nomad has learned from our recent book study, Race Talk and the Conspiracy of Silence, that honest race talk is one of the most powerful means to dispel stereotypes and biases, to increase racial literacy and critical consciousness about race issues, to decrease fear of differences, to broaden one's horizons, to increase compassion and empathy, to increase appreciation of all color and cultures, and to enhance a greater sense of belonging and connectedness. So I am pleased to introduce one of the foremost experts on this, and I'm overwhelmed with joy to have him join us for today's webinar. He is a human rights activist, a pioneer for racial equality, internationally recognized expert on sports and social issues, a scholar and author. Dr. Richard E. Lapchick is often described as the racial conscience of sport. He brought his commitment to equality and his belief that sport can be effective instrument of positive social change to the University of Central Florida in August 2001, where he launched the DeVos Sports Business Management Program. In 2015, it was named the number two program in the world by Sports Business International. Lapchik is a prolific writer. His 17th book was published in 2018. Lapchik is a regular columnist for ESPN.com and the Sports Business Journal. He has spoken in the United States Congress, at the United Nations, in the European Parliament, and at the Vatican. And now to Nomad. How about that? He was inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame of the Commonwealth Nations in the category of humanitarian, along with Arthur Ashe and Nelson Mandela. Dr. Lapchik was inducted into the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame in 2015. He was named as one of the Beyond Sports Inspirational 50 People, living and past, who use sport to change the world, along with Billie Jean King, Muhammad Ali, and Nelson Mandela. Lapchik was named one of the 100 most powerful people in sports. He has received 10 honorary degrees. Dr. Lapchik was one of 200 guests personally invited by Nelson Mandela to his inauguration after leading the American sports boycott of South Africa from 1975 until the end of apartheid. Before we bring Dr. Lapchik on to speak, we have a short video from ESPN to share. Richard grew up in a family there where there was a strong tradition of doing the right thing. His father was an iconic figure. He signed Sweetwater Clifton to the Knicks, breaking the color barrier. His recollections alone of being around his father growing up would fill a dinner table conversation with great tales of meeting Jackie Robinson when he was a kid, seeing what his father went through for fielding the first black player in, in Nick history. Joe was someone who, as a coach, never let race get in the way of doing the right thing. 
And there's no question that that had a huge impact on Richard himself. When I was 14, I was at a basketball camp with five other white guys. One of the white guys was hurling the N-word at the black guy day in and day out till I challenged him and this guy had knocked me out cold. Well, the black guy was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, then Luel Cinder, and a lifelong friendship grew out of that. Everything Richard has fought for has not been popular at the time. And he has been this courageous light that has said, this needs to be said, this needs to be heard and I'm gonna say it. There's a fine line sometimes between um, being courageous and putting your life on the line. With progress comes pain. And that was a price that he, he was willing to pay. When I was the American leader of the sports boycott of South Africa, I was actually attacked in my office in a college library by two masked men and had the N-word carved in my stomach. Richard had very bravely spoken out against apartheid. There were risks involved. There are just a lot of bigots who didn't like what he had to say. He was attacked for standing up and wanting to right a wrong. And to be brutally attacked as he was, to have the N-word carved with scissors into his stomach, he had to have been frightened beyond words and a lesser person would have said, okay, that's it, I'm done, not rich. They who did that, um, it's the wrong person. I've been involved in civil rights for the last 28 years of my life, but I can never, ever, ever know what it's like to be black. That's an instantaneous, every minute sentence that society has given to black communities and Hispanic communities in this country, that discrimination can take place at any time. My dad taught me that a leader is somebody who stands up for justice and doesn't block its path. I've spent most of my adult life trying to help young people who live in crises that have become more profound as the generations have gone on. You know, he's really been in the forefront in the whole bridge between sports and using that to achieve equality, not only here in the United States, but around the world. He's been involved in uh, civil rights and race issues for uh, his entire life. I automatically smile when I think of Richard. Wow. I smile and also a tear comes to my eyes. Whew. He's a good man. I thank him. I'm appreciative of the work that he has done. Thank you. Thank you, Richard Lapchick. Thank you for being you, and thank you for wanting this world to be a better place, and because of you, it is. It, it is my absolute honor to introduce Richard Lapchick to Nomad. Dr. Lapchick, thank you for being here, sir. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with Nomad. I appreciate what Nomad stands for, supporting uh, especially young ADs of color who have our children in their care uh, and their children, as I will outline here this afternoon, are in great jeopardy. It's a dangerous time to be growing up in America. So thank you for what you do. Uh, I'm pleased to spend time with you this afternoon, and I'm going to talk about what I call uncomfortable truths. When George Floyd was murdered, we started the racial reckoning and facing the uncomfortable truth that every form of racism today can tr be traced directly back to slavery. Uh, all those systemic forms of racism that, that I'll talk about today that we've been talking about uh, for the, all the months since the murder of George Floyd go right back to slavery. The second uncomfortable truth came from the Me Too movement and forcing America to face sexism and misogyny. The story about the Washington football team reopened the discussion of the fact that America was actually started with acts of genocide and against the indigenous people of this country. Uh, I live in Orlando where the Pulse nightclub shooting took place, 49, we call them angels, were murdered that night uh, because of homophobia in this country and we still face that scourge of homophobia in our country. 
We talk about violence in the United States sometimes as if it's an abstract idea. Sometimes on the news we see uh, reports of 12 children being killed in Chicago over a particular weekend and are terribly startled by it. On any given day in America, 12 children under, under the age of 16 die of a handgun wound. It's a typical day in America. We are a violent society. So we're all from the world of sport. It's a different world of sport as, as we all know, whether we're competing at the pro level, at the college level, or at the high school level like yourselves. Uh, the pandemic and the racial reckoning have changed sport, I think, forever. Uh, in some ways, I think it's changed it for better, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but we've been on the sidelines for so long in, in this world of sports uh, once the pandemic shut everything down. But I was proud of the world, of the role that sports played in the pandemic and also in the racial reckoning. So you may recall that we were kind of bumbling along as a nation, not really shutting anything down, not really treating the virus seriously until an NBA player tested positively on a Wednesday afternoon. And by Wednesday, Wednesday night, Adam Silver shut down the NBA. All the sports followed in the next couple of days and America began to shut down, something we should have done months before and thousands of lives probably would have been saved. We also saw the big heartedness of sport right away. A 19-year-old rookie named Zion Williamson, who had never played in an NBA game on the day after the league shut down, announced he was giving a million dollars to the workers who were not going to be working at the Pelicans home arena in New Orleans. Uh, he was followed by dozens and dozens of other players, coaches, leagues, and teams who together raised more than $100 million at a time that their incomes were being uh, seriously jeopardized to one, support workers who are going to be out of work, and two, uh, to join in the fight against COVID. But we miss sport, obviously, but we forgot that missing a sport with the murder of Floyd George, forcing us to confront systematic racism immediately, forcing us to confront police brutality. Uh, I have to uh, share with you the uncomfortable news that in 2019, there were only 27 days in America when a police officer did not shoot and kill a citizen of their community. Obviously, there were instances when officers were actually in the line of duty, uh, having uh, defending themselves when, when that shooting took place, but obviously there were also too many Floyd Georges uh, even since that time. And the difference, I think, is that we now have uh, our video camera, our phones, to capture the moment when we can't deny what has actually happened. Police brutality has been part of America uh, for the whole history of America. And police would often say that they were defending themselves or, or justify whatever, however the shooting took place and we couldn't really dispute it. Now with smartphones, we can dispute, dispute it because we've caught the reality. But this isn't about police brutality. It's about systematic racism. It's about racism in housing and education and healthcare in the criminal justice system, in the financial industry where uh, Americans get their resources if they're going to get them, come from a system that is discriminatory right from the start. And it's not just about Black Lives Matter. It's obviously we're paying more attention to the fact of sexism and homophobia and the other forms of discrimination that I talked about and especially anti-immigrant feelings. So I'm going to take a little bit of time and share more about myself to elaborate on what you saw in the video, because I know there have to be a significant number of the more than 100 people uh, on this session who wondered at the start when they saw this 75-year-old white guy here addressing your organization about race. When I was five years old, I looked outside my bedroom window in Yonkers, New York, where I was raised, and saw my father's image swing from a tree with people under the tree picketing. And for several years after that, I'd pick up the extension phone in our house, my dad not knowing I was listening. And it was racial epithet after racial epithet being hurled at him. I didn't know what any of that meant as a five, six, and seven-year-old. How could I? But what I did know was that a lot of people hated a man who I thought was my best friend and the best person on the planet. When I was seven, as a Brooklyn Dodger fan, the Dodgers were then in Brooklyn, of course, uh, my dad asked me if I'd like to come meet Jackie Robinson. He and Jackie Robinson were going to be the co-keynote speakers at a fundraiser at Madison Square Garden. I knew nothing about Jackie Robinson's social significance as a seven-year-old, but hey, he was the star of the team that I was rooting for. So of course I wanted to go meet him 
spent a little bit of time with Jackie Robinson that afternoon. Jackie Robinson went home after it was over to be with his wife, Rachel, and I hope everybody in the audience has either seen the movie 42 or the Ken Burns documentary on Jackie Robinson because both portrayed the passionate love affair that Jackie Robinson had with Rachel Robinson. And I'm proud to tell you and happy to tell you that on the first Monday of, of March, and in fact, the last time I traveled, it was to go to this event, uh, I am a guest of Rachel Robinson at the Jackie Robinson Foundation Gala. Rachel Robinson is now 98 years old and is this incredible human being. And if any of you have ever had the chance to be in her presence, seize that opportunity. She is amazing. But back in New York that afternoon, my dad had a reputation for courting the New York media. So he would invite them to Mama Leone's restaurant, which was a famous Italian restaurant across the street from the old Mad Madison Square Garden. And we were in the bar area of the restaurant and one of the, the not one of the most famous sports writer in America shouted across the bar to his colleagues, who of course were all white men. And unfortunately still today in 2020, there are so many white men dominating the sports media as they dominate other parts of society. But this man shouted across the bar, did you see that end showboating referring to Jackie Robinson? And my dad grabbed my arm and pulled me aside and said, some people only know how to hate. I didn't know what that meant either, but I knew there was something seriously wrong with the country that I was being raised in. So my dad's a double inductee into the Basketball Hall of Fame as a player with the original Celtics. He was the first great big man in the game and as the coach of both the New York Knicks and St. John's University. So everybody told me I was going to follow in his footsteps. That was a dream I certainly embraced. And I was one of the tallest players in New York City as an eighth grader. So I was heavily recruited, including by a school called Power Memorial, which was the dominant basketball high school in the country, along with DeMatha in Washington. And I didn't go there, but I became friends with the coach and he invited me to that summer camp that you saw portrayed in the video, where I literally took a punch challenging one of the other campers at that uh, camp that summer. There were five white guys and a black guy who were all co the coach's players at Power Memorial. And the white guy was, as it was said in the video, was dropping the N-word on the black guy at dawn till dusk till I finally challenged him. And the black guy, as you saw, turns out to be Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. A lifelong friendship began to the point where when his statue was unveiled at the Staples Center, he asked me to speak at it when he was uh, receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Barack Obama in the last month of his administration. Kareem invited me and Henry Louis Gates as his two guests to the White House along with his family. Uh, and when I was scheduled to have surgery in Orlando a number of years ago, Kareem flew from the West Coast to be here with me. So it's been a rich and profound friendship, but what it did at that particular moment for this 15-year-old white kid was gave me a young urban African-American lens to see what racism was doing in his community and other communities of color. And I decided as a 15 year old, I was gonna spend the rest of my life working in the area of civil rights. I didn't know what that meant as a 15 year old, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. I ended up going to graduate school and getting a PhD in international race relations. It was the first such PhD in the country. And I did my doctoral dissertation on how South Africa used sport as part of its foreign policy and the international response and compared it to how the Nazis had done that in the 30s. Uh, I never thought I'd be in the world of sport. I was teaching at a college in, in Norfolk, Virginia and loved it there. Um, but the, book, the dissertation was published as a book. I started to get asked to speak about apartheid. I ended up founding the sports boycott of South Africa in this country. So there was a trade boycott, a bank loan boycott, uh, and a currency boycott with South Africa, as well as a sports boycott. But you could smuggle in currency, you could smuggle in trade, you could smuggle in oil, but you couldn't play sports in the dark. So as a sports-loving nation, the sports boycott became South Africa's Achilles heel. Uh, the European countries had all boycotted South Africa, and I just want to take a second to describe South Africa for those of you who are too young to remember apartheid. But apartheid was the most racist system of government on the face of the earth in the second half of the 20th century. If you were a person of color, and 81% of the people were, you couldn't own land, you couldn't vote, you couldn't send your children to the schools you wanted to, you couldn't live where you wanted to, you were there to serve a very, very wealthy white economy. Uh, it's the only time in peacetime history that the global community came together to try to, try to strangle a regime uh, because of the heinous nature of apartheid. So the first South African team was coming to the United States in 1978. Uh, it was a Davis Cup 
team uh, playing in the North American zone of the Davis Cup. The matches were going to take place in Nashville, Tennessee, at Vanderbilt University. So as the leader of the coalition of groups that was trying to get, get those matches canceled, I flew to Nashville to try to build up the protest. And I would work closely with the African governments who asked me to announce that they would boycott the 1984 Los Angeles Olympic Games if this team was allowed to come. So I announced that at a press conference right before the last speech at Vanderbilt. All three networks were there. Dick Schapp, who was a prominent uh, NBC journalist at the broadcaster at the time, the father of Jeremy Schapp, who you saw in the video. Uh, Dick Schapp came up to me and he said the financial backers of the Davis Cup had pulled out. It looked like the matches were going to be canceled. I announced that to the crowd. It was an anti-apartheid crowd. Uh, they went crazy. And when I flew home to Virginia that night, I thought maybe for the first time in my life, I had done something worthwhile. The next night was the night mentioned in the, in the video. I was working late in my college office. The office was in the school's library. The library closed at 10.30. At 10.45, there was a knock on the door, and I assumed it was the campus security. So I didn't hesitate to open the door. But instead of campus security, it was two men wearing stocking masks who proceeded to cause liver damage, kidney damage, a hernia, a concussion. And as you saw in the video, carved the N-word in my stomach with a pair of office scissors. Laying in the hospital that night, I realized that if people had gone to the length they did to try to stop my father 28 years before, and to the length they did to try to stop me that night, that they must have thought that we were having a serious impact on racism by using the sports platform. And I decided that I was gonna spend the rest of my life using that platform to address issues of racism and other issues of, so of social injustice. And, and that's in effect what I did. So back in 1978, and I don't usually tell this part of the story, but I will because of what's going on now. Uh, I came out of the hospital after three days. I was in our living room with about 25 friends and supporters who had flown in from around the country uh, to be there with me when I got out of the hospital. And a supporter in Nashville called up and shared with me that the Nashville Banner, which was the afternoon newspaper, had run a page one story across the banner headline of the newspaper at the top of the page saying, police accuse Lapchik of self-inflicting wounds. That, needless to say, took me by surprise. One of, the, one of the people in our living room at the time was a neighbor who was an attorney. They said, we better get out and talk to the police. And we did that the next day. The detective in charge of the investigation denied that they had leaked the that story to the press, but obviously they had. He said, I believe the attack took place the way you said it did, but there are people on the force who don't. Why don't you take a lie detector to prove that you did? I knew how police had used lie detectors during the history of the civil rights movement. So I said it was very unlikely that I was gonna to agree to do that, but I would consult with all the civil rights leaders in our coalition and all the major ones were in it. And if they think I should take a lie detector for the good of what we're trying to accomplish in terms of apartheid, then, then I would agree. Uh, the neighbor, the attorney asked the police Detective, what are you going to do with the information that you asked Lapchik to take a lie detector? In case the audience forgot, I'm Lapchik. Uh, he said that no one will know that we asked that until he says yes or no, and then we'll have to make it public. I thought that was fair as a naive uh, young person that I was at that particular moment. And went home and I called all those people in the coalition of groups. Um, and every one of them to a person said, refused to take the lie detector based on principle. Uh, so as I contemplated things that night, I also thought about women who had been sexually assaulted being asked to prove that they had been sexually assaulted and began to understand what it must be like to be in that position. So the next morning I wake up and a reporter from the Virginian Pilot, which was the local newspaper in, in Norfolk, uh, called and said, we understand you have been asked to take a lie detector. The police obviously leaked that story to the press against what they said they would do. Uh, and I told him that I consulted with all the civil rights leaders the night before, that they all agreed that I should refuse to take it based on principle. And I shared that story about what I had thought about the women who had been sexually assaulted uh, with him. And he printed it in the paper the next day. So you can imagine a uh, Southern conservative community reacting to a ha headline in the Virginian pilot and later in what was called the Ledger Star, the afternoon newspaper that afternoon, that I had self-inflicted these wounds. So while I was in the hospital, the police had a medical examiner come and spend some time with me. He never looked at one inch of my body, 
Uh, he happened to be of Indian descent and really spent the time talking about his empathy for the cause that I was involved with, an anti-racist cause, because he had experienced racism uh, as an Indian immigrant in this country. And I never thought much about it. Well, the story in Monday's newspaper featured him. And it said that the Virginia medical examiner examined Lapchik in the hospital and said that all the wounds were consistent with being self-inflicted. He literally never looked at my body. So probably some of you have seen that with all the victims and, and the recent murders and, and shootings in the United States, the families hired a private medical examiner to come and examine the body. And I didn't understand, I, I think most people wouldn't understand that, except that uh, there was a study that was released during this period of time that said that uh, 72 percent of medical examiners in America said they had changed their opinion to conform with what the police had decided uh, was the cause of death. Uh, so that obviously stuck in my mind at that particular moment that this medical examiner was being used in my case. Uh, so I realized that I had to do something. I didn't want the focus to be on me. I wanted it to be on South Africa. So I flew back to Nashville when I realized that I was there, that nobody cared anymore whether South Africa was coming. It was, did Lapchik do it? Didn't Lapchik do it? And I decided to fly to Washington and I had a FBI operative privately administered a lie detector test to me and flew to New York City where we had a civil rights medical examiner examine me. And we released the results of those two tests affirming that the attack had taken place exactly as I said it did. And uh, the United Nations offered to have a press conference for me. And we had that press conference at the United Nations that Monday morning announcing the, the results of these two tests, which was widely covered in the media around the United States and around the globe. And I flew back to Virginia that afternoon under the rumor that I was going to be arrested by the police when I landed uh, back in Virginia. The police weren't at the airport. I guess that they learned the results of those two tests and backed away from that. Uh, but I share that with you today because I want you to understand that, you know, I have a, a deeper understanding than most white people might have of interactions with the police as a result of this. Um, I was hired by the United Nations uh, to come to work in New York City uh, on issues of apartheid. And I think they hired me because they thought, uh, like many in the international community, especially at that time, that racism exists in the American South, not in the North. Let's get them out of the South and he'll be safe. Of course, I knew that racism exists in every nook and cranny of America, uh, but I was happy to go back to New York where I was from and particularly honored to be able to work with the United Nations, which I had uh, uh, held in high esteem. 1981 is the next South African team that's coming. It's a rugby team on its way to New Zealand where rugby is a more popular sport. And, but they were gonna play three test matches in the United States, so we formed a coalition to get those matches stopped. We met every Thursday night at the Church Center for the United Nations, which was across the street from the UN. Anyone who wanted to know where I was would know I was there because I was the chair of that coalition. We had, I bought a car from, an, from a friend at the United Nations that night and drove it home to the Upper West Side where I was living in New York City. When I moved to New York, we bought a house in Woodstock, New York, which is about two hours north of the city as a kind of weekend summer getaway. And my family was spending the summer there and I would be driving up on this particular Friday afternoon in this car that I had just purchased uh, to visit them. But when I got back to the apartment, they were there. They decided they were gonna surprise me. They were frantically running about the lobby because someone had broken into the apartment, hadn't touched any of their things, had ransacked all of my things. And the only thing that they took was the manuscript of a book I was writing about this particular period of time. The New York City police came and told my family to go back up to Woodstock, which they did the next day in that car that I had just purchased. And I went back to the United Nations, this time under heavy armed guard. At about 11 o'clock that morning, the woman who was my wife at the time called me up and said, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I didn't know there was a chance she wouldn't be okay. Going 65 miles an hour on the New York State Thruway, the car's engine seized up and she was able to wrestle it to the side of the road because there was no traffic at that hour bringing herself and the children to safety. Somebody had tampered with the engine on the streets of New York the night before. Two nights later, the police found uh, two men under the hood of the car we were trying to replace and chased them into Central Park. And I tell you that part of the story to affirm the fact that racism exists in every nook and cranny of our country in the United States, and I would argue around the world as well. 
So we got all those matches canceled, but the South Africans wanted to save face. So they scheduled a game in Albany, New York, about two hours north of the city. And they, they think, I think they scheduled it there because they felt we'd never be able to get a large protest. But we had other things in mind, so we organized buses of people to go to Albany. And I made a hotel reservation along with the two people who were my bodyguards uh, in, a, in a hotel near the, arena, near the stadium where the match was scheduled to take place. Uh, at the last minute, I decided I would stay in Woodstock in that house I mentioned before. Uh, so we didn't go to, to Albany. When I woke up the next morning, the news was that a bomb had exploded outside the hotel we were supposed to stay in, obviously meant to scare us and intimidate us. Um, and it obviously did give us pause, but we weren't there and nobody was hurt in that. Um, so again, um, we were able to have that large protest there. Um, we were able to uh, basically end sports relations with South Africa and that was the end of that. So I share that with you so you know that my involvement in race and sport has been deeply personal and very profound, uh, that there have been other issues that I've gotten involved in besides uh, racial justice. I have had women in my life who have been very influential. My sister, so I'm 75, she's 87. She was active in the civil rights movement in the 1950s before it was called the civil rights movement. She moved to Africa in 1961 and I started to read about Africa and fell in love with the continent. And eventually that's how I got involved in the anti-apartheid movement. My wife, Anne, who I've been madly in love with for the last 34 years, uh, will point out any form of sexism that she hears on television or in public, or if I say something that she thinks is, in, that is wrong, she'll definitely mention it to me, as will our 31-year-old daughter, Emily. Things are obviously better for women, but they're still not right. In the 2016 election, there was a lot of discussion of the fact that women earn 78 cents on the dollar, what a white man earns. That's white women. What wasn't often said is that black women earn 64 cents on the dollar and Latinas earn 53 cents on the dollar. Women make up nearly 51% of the population in America, yet they only hold 19% of the seats in the, in the House and 22% of the seats in the US Senate. We rank, believe it or not, 100th globally, 100th globally in the representation of women in national offices. We rank behind Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan, not exactly known for their feminist politics. Maybe that's why in part the United States, along with Swaziland, Lesotho, and Papua New Guinea are the only countries on the planet that do not have paid maternity leave as part of the law of the land. We rank 46th in the world in terms of maternal mortality rates behind Saudi Arabia, Libya, Kuwait, and Kazakhstan. Only 4% of the Fortune 500 companies are led by women. Only three, by the way, are led by black people. On a global perspective, I realize that, you know, while things are uh, problematic, to say the least, for women in America, they're even worse globally. So one of the most influential books I read was called Half the Sky by Nicholas Kristof and his wife, Cheryl Woodun. Kristof's a New York Times columnist. And these are the, it's about the global oppression of women and the heroic resistance of women to that oppression. Uh, but these are the two statistics that stick with me and that I try to share with audiences whenever I speak. More women and girls died simply because they were women, a woman or a girl in the 20th century than all the soldiers who died in all the wars of the 20th century combined. In any decade of the 20th century, more women and girls were murdered in acts of gendercide than all of the people who died in acts of genocide in the 20th century combined. Every morning I wake up and I think of the 32 million school-age girls globally who won't go to school that day because it's either against the law or the customs of their country for a girl to get an education. It's why the, the then wonder child Malala, as a 16-year-old, literally risked her life so that girls in her village could get an education. She ended up being shot in the face and ultimately winning the Nobel Peace Prize as the youngest recipient ever. So women and girls globally between the ages of 15 and 44 are more likely to die or be maimed by an act of male violence by someone they know than who are maimed or die from cancer, malaria, war, and traffic accidents combined. 100,000 girls under the age of 12 are sold as child brides every year, never to see their families again. More than 100 million women and girls have experienced female genital mutilation. If you don't know what that is, 
It's a surgical procedure on the female genitalia for non-medical reasons, for cultural reasons. Uh, millions of girls and women are sold into human trafficking, including in the United States. Uh, more than half of, uh, half of the people who are trafficked, and I'll talk about human trafficking a little more in, in a minute, are women or girls. Former President Jimmy Carter called the abuse of women and girls the number one human rights abuse in the world today. I don't know if it's the worst, but it's certainly up there with the worst, and I'm going to share some of what is the worst. So when Barack Obama became president in the United States, there were 625 hate groups. When he left office, there were 925 hate groups. Today, after four years of Donald Trump's administration, there are 1,100 hate groups in the United States. There were an average of 100 hate incidents uh, uh, classified by the FBI during a month during the Barack Obama administration. During the Trump administration, there have been 1,100 hate incidents a month recorded by the FBI. I don't think there are more racists in the country today than there were four years ago, but I think the administration of Donald Trump has embraced and allowed them to be able to be outspoken, uh, such as, as he did in that incredible statement he made about uh, standby, but th th to be ready in his first and only presidential debate so far. It's why the vote is so important, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Our children have learned how to hate each other. Uh, and this is the climate that they're being raised in. They're also waging war on one another, and you know this better than anybody else, being involved in, in the educational system as you are, that according to the Center for Disease Control, 400,000 high school students were taken to emergency rooms because of acts of violence that took place on high school property during high school hours two years ago, same statistics for the last four years. Uh, it's estimated, and that's not in the middle of the night in some dark place in town, on high school property during high school hours, 400,000 high school students were taken to emergency rooms. I said earlier that 12 children every day under the age of 16 die of a handgun wound. Our children are waging war on one another. You know this statistic better than anybody. 40% of urban high school students drop out of high school before they complete that degree. In America, 4.5 million women are battered every year, 800,000 are raped every year. 34% of teenage girls, 34% will have a child before they reach the age of 20. When researchers ask them, why did you take a chance of your education being disrupted? Why did you take a chance of maybe not getting the job that you would hope, hope for when you grow up? The almost universal response that those girls give is, because I wanted somebody to love me because they didn't feel loved at the time. We're the biggest consumers of drugs in the world. The biggest consumers of drugs in America are people under the age of 25. Why do you take a drug? Because you presumably you think you feel better with it than without it. The biggest consumers of performance enhancing drugs in America are not NFL players or Major League Baseball players or, or track and field athletes. They're teenage boys under the age of 16 who are not athletes at all, but who feel frail in the, their self-image in terms of what God gave them as their body and take that substance that may lead to ultimate uh, physical harm for them uh, throughout their lives. The Penn State football story several years ago exposed the issue of child abuse in America, focusing on the 11 victims of the assistant coach of, of Penn State, Jerry Sandusky. And I hope that what comes out of it is we understand as was publicized, but I hope the memory that we take away from it is that there's a report of child abuse in America every 10 seconds, and one in 10 cases of child abuse are actually reported. So I mentioned human trafficking before. So in my studies as uh, in pursuing a degree in international race relations, we studied the Atlantic slave trade. And during that period of time, 240 years of the, some of the worst history uh, in the history of the globe, some of the most heinous acts in the history of the globe, maybe paralleled by the Holocaust in the 1940s. Um, there were 8 million Africans enslaved in Africa. There were 8 million, sorry, 6 million Africans enslaved in Asia and 10 million enslaved in the Americas. Another 10 million died in the, in the, traffic, in the process of getting, uh, transporting the people to where they were being transported to be enslaved. So over 240 years, there were 24 million people who were enslaved. Today, as we sit here, we should be together somewhere, but we're in our homes or wherever we are. Um, there, there, it's estimated there are between 28 and 32 million human slaves, close to a million in the United States. Again, as I said earlier, 
More than half are women and girls. More than half of them are girls. Most of those girls will be brought into the sex trade. For a quick, horrible snapshot of that, the average age of girls brought into sex, tra sex trade in the United States is 12. She's gonna have sex 10 times a day, 365 days a year. If somehow she became freed by the time she was 16, which is not likely, it's more likely that she would be murdered by her pimp if she tried to escape or die of HIV AIDS. But if she did escape, um, she would have been raped 16,000 times by the time she did escape. Imagine, most of us know somebody who's been sexually assaulted, something that lives with them every day of their lives, what it would be like to try to overcome being raped 16,000 times. The good news is that psychologists tell us that, um, that if a girl or a boy, because some boys are brought into the sex trade as well, um, gets the proper, gets an education, gets housing, gets the opportunity to have a, sec, a different economic opportunity, a job, uh, the chances are they can overcome those and live a normal life. Um, we're all from the world of sport. I'm going to give you a sense of the magnitude of human trafficking. So if you combine the 67 largest professional sports leagues in the world, the average, the revenue earned last year was $62.5 billion. We say sports is a big business. That's why sports is a big business. $62.5 billion generated in the 67 top professional sports leagues in the world. In the world. The human trafficking net revenue per year is $150 billion a year, two and a half times the total scope of what's earned in revenue in the world of sports. So what I wanna focus on because it's the root cause of all the other forms of structural racism in the United States today is the wealth gap. So I mentioned that apartheid was the most racist system of government on the face of the earth in the second half of the 20th century. The wealth gap in the United States between black people and white people today is larger than it was between black people and white people in South Africa during the height of apartheid. Try to comprehend what I just said. Try to comprehend this. The Forbes list of the 400 wealthiest Americans have an aggregate wealth greater than all 42 million African Americans combined. How do you combat the systematic racism that stems from that wealth gap? Because everything does stem from it. If you are in the lowest 10% of the income earning group in America, you're gonna live 14 years less than if you're in the highest income group. Black infant mortality, infant mortality is twice that as white babies. Just in the COVID era, we've heard story after story that black people are two and a half times as likely to contract COVID and three times as likely to die as white people. Brown people are three times as likely to contract it and three times as likely to die as white people. Indigenous people are five times as likely to get it and four times as likely to die from it. Having skin color different than being white condemns you to have inadequate health care when you go to get whatever it is that you need to have help fixed by a doctor. We have 5% of the world's population in the United States. We have 25% of the world's prison population. They're mostly brown and black. They've mostly committed crimes that won't even be on the books in the United States in several years, minor drug offenses. And some people say, well, when they get out of jail, they can resume a normal life. It's not that easy. When you get out of jail, you can't vote, you can't get public housing, you can't get food stamps, uh, you can't get any form of federal uh, you, and usually state assistance. And ultimately, if you go to an employer and ask for a job and the question comes up, have you ever committed a felony? And the answer is yes. That's generally speaking, going to be the end of the interview at that particular moment. So I'm going to have spent about 30, a little bit more than that minutes with you today. And if it was a typical 30 minutes, this is what would have happened. 70 children dropped out of high school. 23 high school students were victimized by violence. A child under the age of 16 was likely to be killed by a gun. 42 children were reported missing. 23 babies were born to a teenage mother. 1,800 children were abused. 258 women or girls were battered. 52 were raped. 57 were enslaved during the little more than 30 minutes that we're gonna sp spend here together. I don't have the slightest doubt that if there were more women and people of color in charge of this country, in charge of our corporations, in charge of our educational system, in charge of faith-based America, that we'd be addressing these issues that I'm talking about today instead of the ones that we address in Washington routinely. If women and people of color are there, we're gonna have a different set of circumstances. So I will, 
uh, answer questions in a minute because I know there hopefully there are some questions, but I just want to close by telling you that when I was uh, first getting involved in this in, in the early 1970s and went through a training session, the trainer uh, did an icebreaker and she asked us to write what we would like to see on our tombstone. And this is what I wrote. Uh, I've added a couple of categories, but almost everyone was on what I wrote that day. He didn't have to be Jewish to want to fight against anti-Semitism. He didn't have to be a person of color to want to fight against racism. He didn't have to be a woman to want to fight against sexism. He didn't have to be from the LGBTQ community to fight against homophobia. He didn't have to be Muslim to want to fight against Islamophobia. He didn't have to be poor to want to fight against poverty. He didn't have to be have a physical or mental disability to want to fight for people who do. He didn't have to be an immigrant or a refugee to fight against xenophobia. He understood that we're all cut from the same human fabric. If we embrace diversity and listen to diverse voices, we have, can help our children who are waging war on one another to get the tools of peace. If they're learning how to hate each other, we can teach them how to love again. And you have that role as athletic directors and people in charge of the young people in the schools that you we're lucky enough that you are working with. Uh, so I thank you for listening. I thank you for what you do every single day. And uh, it was a blessing for me to be able to spend some time with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lapchik. We really appreciate it. Um, one question that we had that we really would love to hear from you is, um, What's the best way to start these conversations about race with our coaches and athletes? Well, I think, first of all, you have to, and I'm sure you know this, that most coaches aren't prepared to talk about race. Uh, I've had no experience in it, um, have been um, uh, kind of intimidated uh, because they don't, don't have a knowledge. So for me, the first thing that you need to do in your school system uh, with coaches, and I would say this with faculty as well, is diversity and inclusion training. Get some group in there who can uh, help those coaches and help your faculty understand the dimensions of diversity uh, and to help prepare them to be able to have those conversations uh, with their student athletes. I would say you know, that you need to uh, adopt some things in your athletic departments that I would suggest. In addition to sensitizing those coaches, uh, you know, we started to talk about Juneteenth this year to celebrate Juneteenth in your school system, to make sure that you recognize um, people of color who have made great contributions in your school system uh, in, in athletics in your sense, uh, to have events that, that um, commemorate whatever it is that they've accomplished, uh, to get your students involved uh, in social justice issues, to have, have uh, lectures or presentations made to them on racial issues and, and other issue, issues of social justice. Um, your students are obviously too young to vote, but I think by your example, um, your coaches and, and those of you in athletic departments have to set that example by emphasizing that you are going to vote on election day or before election day because of this crit critical election facing us, not only the presidential election, but local elections. You know, most communities elect police chiefs or, or sheriffs uh, so if they're not serving the community in the way that you think they should be, uh, vote them out. Get somebody in there who's more aligned with your philosophy. Uh, so those are some things that I would suggest for your athletic departments. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, do you have another question? Yeah, Anthony, one more question. This will be the final question. Dr. Lapchick, this comes from Carolyn Sidico in San Francisco. Can you please grace us with a specific description of what your reimagination is of the future of American sports? Well, first of all, I think it's already started. I think that the best thing that's happened in this period of time is athlete activism. Um, you know, we saw the Milwaukee Bucks, the favored team in the NBA playoffs, not come out on the court and face expulsion. I mean, in normal times, they would have one, not gotten paid, two, never been allowed to re-enter the playoffs. But they, this is a time when an hour later, the NBA and its Players Association both said, we're shutting down and all the other sports did the next day. Um, so athletes have that power. Just four years ago, when Colin Kaepernick took a knee for the first time, I think most of the American people disapproved of that. 
Um, but a recent Nielsen study of sports fans and racism said that 77% of sports fans, who I think of as generally speaking, a conservative group of people, support athlete activism, support athletes taking action against racism, ask their teams to support their athletes, and ask uh, the, the uh, companies that they support and patronize to be engaged in social justice movements. So this is a huge shift uh, in, in the American landscape. So I think we need to take advantage. So my reimagined world of sports has more women and people of color leading us. You know, we do something called the racial and gender report card. And I can tell you that it's still overwhelmingly white men who hold those positions of power in leagues, on teams, um, and in college athletic departments. And you know the landscape better than I do at the high school level. What, what an exception you are. Those of you who are members of NOMAD, you know, are not the norm in high school sport. They're, we don't have as many people of color and women running our sports program. So more people uh, running our program, more opportunities to really get and counsel our student athletes so they get real meaningful educations, both at the high school level and be prepared for when they go to college. That's great. I know, Dr. Labchick, you have to run because you have a, a one o'clock meeting, so we want to let you go. But we want to thank you again for your time and for everything that you've done um, for sports and for our, our society. And we are forever in your debt. And uh, we hope to have you back again when, when new things arise and uh, you can continue to, to guide us and, and help us lead our students. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And Good luck with everything you're going to do with Nomad. It's so critically important to the future of young people in our country. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Uh, we're going to share out um, some resources for everyone. Um, you know, you'll be able to get this uh, slide deck from us as along with the, um, the video. Uh, certainly, I would share it with uh, students, coaches, where, however you feel fit to help it impact your uh, departments. Um, and then if we can get to the next slide. Um, we have part two, like I mentioned before, this is a two part um, series. Part two is really um, uh, the discussion about strategies and implementation. We have an incredible panel coming on to, to give us those uh, ideas and ways to engage our students. Um, so we are looking forward to that. That's on October 29th, uh, starting at 930. And then in November, we're very excited to present the life of duality, women of color and athletic administration. So we are going to continue on that theme. So really grateful for you all to, to, to support Nomad today and coming out. And we look forward to continuing to work for you and with you on in supporting your efforts to improve your communities, make them more inclusive, and where everyone feels like they belong. And that is our goal. And so we thank you so much for coming today. And um, if there are any questions, um, shoot, feel free. I will stick around if you have a couple of questions that you want to ask. Um, we are in the middle of a book study where we are talking about race talk and the conspiracy of silence and we are learning a great deal from that. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions and some of the things that I'm implementing here at Parker. If any of my other panelists and, and board members have any suggestions or advice on those topics, uh, shoot them out, fellas. Anthony, just real quick, I want to jump in for all those still with us. Thank you very much for participating in our third webinar. As you see, our upcoming schedule, just a reminder, the highlighted times are um, Pacific times. Um, we are dealing with uh, a, a national webinar, so we have different time zones. Reminder, um, that 9.30 to 11 a.m. is Pacific time, so that'll change. It'll be in the afternoon for those of us on the East Coast. And, and once again, please continue to share our, our registration information with them. And if you have not signed up to be a member of NOMAD, please do that as well. You can go to our website, the nomadassociation.org, follow us on Twitter, and everything that we do will be made available to all registrants and will make its way to our website as well. And also uh, the, the recording of this uh, webinar today will be posted on our website as well sometime tomorrow afternoon. And you will also receive um, a link to um, 
you provide us feedback on this webinar. So be on the lookout for that. Um, we always want to hear from our members um, so we can continue to work for you and provide uh, all the resources um, that you need. So um, be ready for that survey uh, to give us feedback on today's presentation. And um, we look forward to seeing you again uh, in a couple of weeks uh, where we'll have Dr. Scott Brooks from Arizona State and the Global Sports Institute and um, Dr. Renee Miles Payne from the University of Miami, uh, two, two of our, our keynote panelists for next week who are going to, or for two weeks from now, who are going to give us strategies and implementation on how to approach this topic with uh, your student athletes and your coaches. So again, thanks again. Um, we, we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks and I hope everyone has a, a great rest of their day. Take care, everyone.